mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to your word humbly. We come to your word as people in need of a Savior. We come to the word as broken and grieving people. And as we go to your word, may our eyes be opened. May you reveal to us the story that you are working out through all of history, the story of redemption and restoration. May our hearts be drawn towards you. In darkness and in light, may we always remember who you are and what you are and what you have done for us. We do not deserve what you have done for us, but you have done it in grace and love that is beyond our understanding. So as we approach your word, may our hearts and our minds be open to that great story that you have invited us to be a part of. In Jesus' name, amen. I really love this passage in Matthew. Um, It's often called the Beatitudes, which is translated as the blessings. And I love these blessings because not only does it introduce the longest passage of Jesus' teaching in any of the Gospels, but I also love that anyone who was listening to it at that time, I would imagine that they felt that Jesus was speaking directly to them. And I want to give a little context to who he was speaking to. He was speaking to his disciples and the Jewish people. And at this time, they had been conquered for a long time and being ruled over by the Roman Empire, who took every, every opportunity to dominate and demean and remind the Jewish people that they were not in charge. And you always knew it. And not only were they oppressed and constantly reminded of that, but then they were surrounded by these cultural and religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had these unreachable standards that you had to meet to be a good Jew, to be loved by God. These standards that nobody could reach, these laws that they put together that only made them more righteous and everyone else less righteous. And then on top of that, you had people on the outskirts. These were the zealots who would show up every once in a while and say, let's just throw off the shackles, rise up and fight. So these Jewish peoples on all sides were hemmed in and they were in a place of mourning and of grief and of brokenness. So when God was saying these things, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, they must have thought, oh, he's speaking to me. That's how I feel. That's how I feel right now. And not that it was ever in question, but I think us understanding who he was speaking to helps us realize that Jesus wasn't just talking to them. He's speaking to us. And as I talk about godly grief, it is going to be in context of this past year, living in this world of COVID. I love seeing everybody, but still, it's different than it was a little over a year ago, not seeing everyone. Hello, everyone at home. I miss seeing you, and I miss seeing your whole faces and your mouths. Oftentimes, when I'm teaching and I'm preaching, I vibe off of where people's facial cues are. I have no idea. I'm just going to do the best I can. But Jesus is speaking to us, and I want to talk about grief, and I want to sit in it for a little while and reflect on it a little while. But I want to make it very, very clear that what I'm speaking about, the focus and the main point is not grief, it is actually hope. We are going to land on hope, but I truly believe to truly understand the hope that we have and the gift of hope and love and grace that Jesus has given to us to fully understand that we need to understand grief. 
And it can be hard to sit in, it can be hard to look at, but I think when we do, as when we start to turn to hope, our understanding will blossom in understanding that gift. Now the question is, what is grief? And the best analogy that I could think of is when we in our bodies experience pain, a headache or a toothache or a stomach ache, our bodies are telling us something's wrong, something is not right, something isn't the way that it should be. This is not how it was designed, this is not how it's supposed to function. And grief and mourning is the same way. It is our hearts, it is our souls saying, this isn't right, this isn't how it should be. And all humans can share in that. We've all experienced grief and mourning. And in that moment, it was like, why is it this way? Why does it have to be this way? It shouldn't be this way. And this past year, I know all of us have experienced that in significant ways. Whether it's the loss of a loved one to COVID, or getting COVID yourself, and how scary that can be. The loss of community and connection and family. The loss of jobs, being at home, the, not being able to go to school. Kids thrive off being together and they were at home. And nobody's perfect, so being home with your family can be a really hard thing. And how many people were isolated? That's hard. There's stories, millions of stories for every person on the planet who can share their own stories of grief and mourning that they experienced this past year. My own story was, this is one of the most exciting and difficult years I've ever experienced because I welcomed my son into this world, my baby James. He was born on March 17th of last year, St. Patrick's Day, which is super fun. You don't plan it, it just happens. A couple days before, my wife and I went into the hospital as she began to go into labor. And at that point, the only thing we knew about COVID was the fact that Schools were going to close for a couple weeks just to make sure everyone could be safe. Just as, a, just as a precaution, everybody. Yeah, okay. So we go in, and then obviously we were very occupied for the next couple days as my wife was delivering our child. And that was, that was actually very difficult, and that has its own story of struggle and grief. But in the end, we had our son, baby James, and it was so exciting. And we had to stay a couple extra days for recovery. And we got out that Friday, just a few days later, and I was driving home. I've never seen the roads so quiet. It was such a strange experience. And as we were driving home, I mean, I looked at my wife and I looked back at my son. I was like, I don't know what we're driving into. We were driving home, but I didn't know what we were driving into. Her parents visited. They were supposed to stay for a while. They only stayed for 36 hours because all of a sudden, states were going to be closing down their borders. They, didn't, they literally thought there were maybe barricades in the road between Pennsylvania and New York, and they wouldn't be able to get home, so they left. And then for months, my wife and I were alone. We had visions and dreams of sharing our new baby boy with our community and with our friends and our family. And I know this story might resonate with some people in our church who also had children. We had so many, five or six children in the past year and a half. So people have shared in this experience of having a child, being excited, but the grief that comes from being in a world where you can't share that joy. And that's my story. And the rest of the year is difficult. And thankfully, I kept my job and I didn't lose anybody, but figuring out what work looks like and how to be safe and what the future holds and having a baby boy, all that was hard. And I mean, there was moments where I definitely felt depressed because I love being with people. And I'm the children's director here at Bethany. And I'm also the facility manager. I have two jobs here. And I would come into the church last year, and it was just quiet. And that weighed so heavily on my heart. And I grieved that I couldn't be with you, that I couldn't be with the children. And the whole time I was thinking, this isn't how it's supposed to be. This is not how it's supposed to be. And we can take a look, if we take a step back, even from our personal lives and the lives of other people, we look at the whole world and the universe itself is also broken and grieving. COVID has been a global pandemic, and we all share in that grief. But that's not the only thing this past year has been hard. No matter what side of the line you fall on politically, everyone has experienced grief and suffering because of how everything happened. And seeing how people interrelated with one another and how they treated one another, all of us are saying, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And even as we, as a nation, work to redeem 
the racial tension and the racial issues that are prevalent in our culture as we try to solve those things and work on them. It is also out of suffering and grief of so many people that that is happening. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this hard. Paul says in Romans, and I love this verse, we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. He's talking about how this world has fallen. The story that God is telling is one of creation and then the fall of man and then how he redeemed man on Jesus Christ. But the last part is restoration, and we are still working towards that point. But right now, all creation is groaning. Entropy is this theory that everything, all orders tend towards disorder. Things break down over time. And as an example of that, our world every year moves 1.5 centimeters further away from the sun. So we don't have to worry about that for trillions of years. Don't worry about it. It's fine. But it's there. And that reality is saying, okay, we as humans are broken, and also the world itself is broken. And all of us grieve in different ways. I'm an avoider and a repressor. I'm, I'm a cool cucumber. <laughs> But this year, I had a hard time. And I avoided a lot of the grief and struggles that I was experiencing. I watched more Netflix than I would like to tell anybody. Um, I gained the COVID-15 and the dad bod 15. So I've got a little bit going on here. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and I've also, I keep my ears busy all the time because I just try to avoid. So podcasts have been my lifeline in the past year. I've listened to so many hours of podcasts that is now calculated in days. I've listened to days worth of podcasts. I would love anybody to guess how many days worth of podcasts did I listen to last year? Anybody? 15, one more guess. Seven. 28 days. 28 days. That is about two hours a day. And there's some days I didn't, so that means some days I was listening to four or five hours of podcasts because it kept my mind busy. I just didn't think about things. And I didn't even listen to music because music leaves too much time to think. It makes you think. So I listen to podcasts. That's how I grieved. And I feel like a lot of people can relate to that. So now that I've laid this heavy burden of grief on your minds and on your hearts to think about it, I want to transition into talking about hope. And also to remind you that when Jesus was speaking, blessed are the meek and those who mourn. Jesus is speaking to us those who are broken. And he opens the, the passage when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this image of the kingdom of heaven is where I want to sit for a little while. And there's this really cool theological concept called the kingdom of heaven is already, but not yet. It means we have the kingdom of God right now. We are blessed with forgiveness and grace and love that we don't deserve because Jesus died on the cross for us. But it's also not yet in that Christ went up to heaven, but he said, you know what, I'll be back. I'll be back. And this already that we experience now, Christ said in John 15, I will send you the helper. And that can also be translated the comforter. So again, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I will send you the comforter from the Father. And this comforter is the spirit of truth who comes from the Father. And when he comes, he will tell you about me, and you will tell people about me too. We have the spirit now, and the spirit shows up in amazing ways. Miracles still happen today. And we also get glimpses of the spirit when we are together like this in community, worshiping together and being together. That is a glimpse of the kingdom. We have it now. That joy that we experience, and if you are at home, we still experience it with you, and we can't wait to do it in person with you again, but we get glimpses of that now. Anytime you receive love or grace or peace that is undeserved from another person, that's a glimpse of this kingdom. It's the fruits of the Spirit. We've been working on that with the kids at Tuesday Club. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Oh, here we go. Faithfulness. Kate, do you remember the last two? Gentleness and self-control. Thank you very much, Kate. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, thank, 
See, they're great. They're so great. When we experience those things from other people and when we feel them from the Spirit and from God, those are glimpses of the kingdom. But that's not it. Because we still do live in a world that still struggles. So now we get to rest in the hope that we have glimpses of hope now. But the not yet kingdom is where I'm so excited. And I love to dream about this not yet kingdom. It says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to recreate creation. He's going to restore creation. And in the end, it says in Revelations find the right passage. I got excited here. It says he will wipe away every tear. Every tear. What a blessing that is. And the grief that we've held this past year, it will pass. But we have a hope in that we will get to celebrate for all eternity together. And I'm so excited about that. So we have hope now and hope to look forward to. We have love and grace now, and we have love and grace to look forward to. We have community now in small ways, but we get complete, everlasting community in the future. That's so exciting. But I want to take a second and have a reality check. If people are grieving now, or did grieve, if I had said this then, you'd probably look at me, those are nice words, Jacob. That sounds nice. But this is hard. This is really hard. I'm not sure I can see hope right now. And I want to say that's an okay place to be in. This, this hope that I'm talking about right now, this hope that we have now, does not mean an absence of grief. But it helps us in our grief. And if you are grieving now, and you don't feel the hope, or one day you will grieve, I want to give you a tool to grieve. And that is the tool of lament that we see through the Psalms. It was actually a little funny this morning. I, I picked out Psalms 13 as an example of a lament. And when Paul came to do the call to worship, I was like, hey, I was hoping to do Psalm 13. He's like, oh, that's the one I already had picked out. And I love when God lines things up. He just does that. He's cool like that. Glimpse of the kingdom. There we go. But here's the example. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. There's four parts of a lament and it's okay. The first is just turn to God. And you can ask him, why God? All through the Psalms. Go to the Psalms. They are a great example. Why God? How long, Lord? And then bring him your complaint. Why is this so hard? Why? I promise you, I promise you, God can handle your disappointment or upset when you are upset. He can handle it. And he loves you. So turn to him, bring your complaint, ask boldly for what you need. And God provides in ways sometimes that we don't ask for, but he will provide. You will get a glimpse of the kingdom. And then the last, you have to turn and to trust, even though it's hard. So if you feel far from hope or you ever find yourself feeling far from hope, it is okay to lament and to grieve and to go to God. And if, again, you feel alone in your grief, I want to remind you of the gospel. And this gospel is where the core of hope can rest in your heart. And no matter what happens, it will grow into something meaningful. Christ came, and as it says in Philippians 2, he humbled himself unto the point of death. Christ experienced loneliness. He was chastised and ignored, and he was put on trial unjustly, and he was beaten and killed. He lost family members. He has experienced the grief. Christ came because he loved us, and in your grief, remember that you are not alone. He doesn't ask you to do something that he hasn't done himself. And he, not only did he do it himself, but he did it, and then there was a moment where he cried out, God, God, why have you forsaken me? When he was on the cross, he was alone but because of what he did, being that alone and that in pain, that 
grief that he experienced was so that we could have hope. We would never have to say, God, why have you forsaken me? Because he is always with us. And we are not perfect. This past year, during COVID, I know I have, my patience is small. My understanding and willingness to listen has shrunk because I'm in a hard spot. And I know I am broken and sinful. But this grief that Christ experiences is saying, even in your grief and your brokenness, I have hope for you. I have redeemed. And there's this wonderful passage that I think sums up so much of this mourning, but also the comfort. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world and he is in the process of restoring it. And he loves you. And he grieves with you. And he has grieved on the cross for you because he loves you. So whether you are in a place of grieving, let it remind you that, you know what, this isn't right. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. There should be a whisper that says, you're right, it's not because there's something that is right, that is complete, that is perfect, that is yet to come. And I challenge you all, if you have that hope, share it with others. COVID is the great equalizer in that we have all in the whole world experienced it. And not that we ever had an excuse not to speak of Christ and the gospel to others, but more than ever, we have the ability to say to those who we know, our co-workers, our neighbors, our friends, our family, hey, what was COVID like this past year for you? Oh, that's hard. Here's how it was hard for me. But I have a hope that surpasses understanding, and I still trust. And I, man, this whole COVID situation makes me excited for when everything's going to be perfect when Jesus comes back. You have a door into a conversation with everybody on the planet now that we've all experienced the same thing. So take courage, take hope in this grief that we have shared that you can also share that hope with others and the world needs hope. The world is in desperate need of hope. And even to encourage one another. I love Paul's word in Romans. Again, this is right after he was talking about creation groaning. He says, not only is creation growing, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. There's an eagerness in us when we experience grief to get out of it. But I encourage you, don't look for grief, but look for hope in that love and grace and peace that is beyond anything we understand and share it with others. Be the glimpse of the kingdom. Be the now. The Spirit is in you. The Spirit rests in you. The Spirit of truth. You can be the glimpse of that joy and that hope to everyone around you and say, you know what? I'm, I'm just working, doing my Father's work, but He is something greater. And man, He would love for you to know Him. He would love to you, for you to be a part of the kingdom, to be His son, to be His daughter. That is what He wants. So in closing, whether you have a heavy heart because of grief and because of this past year or what may happen in the future, things are still looking good, but people are just getting back on their feet. If you are heavy, let it remind you that this is not what it is supposed to be like, that God has something great and it is coming and he is so excited to share it with you. And if you are riding high off that hope and so excited, please share it with others. They need it. I'm so thankful to be here and to be experiencing the kingdom right now with you in this community, this love and grace. I am so thankful. And I pray that you go and feel that also. And I do just want to close rereading Jesus' word. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Will you close with me in prayer?